Hey, so welcome to class, everybody. Um, it's time to learn some chemistry. Um, okay, so uh, we are going to. I'm really nervous right now. It's just really nervous. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the atom a little bit more. I can't even walk over that far. So I'm standing right here, I guess. All right. So we're going to talk about the atom, a little bit more about how the discovery of the subatomic particles took place. This is really interesting stuff. Um, you probably won't be quite as interested in it as I am, but it's very interesting stuff. Okay, so I really, I, I like this history, and um, there's a really cool video that I could not find this morning. They took it off Discovery Streaming for some reason, um, but it, it sort of goes through this whole, like, um, it was almost a battle between scientists for the atom. Um, the history of how the atom finally came to be what we think of it as now. Um, it's just, it's a very interesting history and there were a lot of scientists who got really, really intense about it. To the point that they were going to each other's lectures and uh, standing up in the middle of the lecture and yelling at one another. Um, so, I mean, that's about as crazy as scientists get, you know. <laughs> you crash another person's lecture. So. And that's what they used to do. It's like, hey, we're going to go crash this guy's lecture. You want to come do it with us? We might throw some toilet paper or something. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. So it is, it is very interesting stuff. Um, we left off with Dalton. Okay, the last person we talked about was Dalton. And Dalton basically said that the atom cannot be divided, um, cannot be destroyed. It's just a sphere. Okay. So his model of the atom was just, you know, it was sort of like a marble. That was his model of the atom, except a really, 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 really tiny marble. Okay, um, and so this this is going to seem to not relate right away, um, but this actually led to people realizing that Dalton's ideas were not exactly correct about uh, about the indestructible atom. Okay, so cathode rays are kind of cool. We used to have a cathode ray tube in here. Um, we called it the freshman zapper. <laughs> It's it no longer functions, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, actually, I don't even know where it is now uh, because this summer everything got sort of moved all over the place. But I will show you a video of how this cathode ray tube works. Okay, um, so the cathode ray is basically just a it's like this green beam. Okay, and and basically scientists were just playing with electricity in the late 1800s. They were fascinated by it, and that's you know everyone was just playing with electricity all the time. And so, you know, I, I just picture these scientists, like, everything that they could where they were doing an experiment, you know, another scientist would come in and be like, let's put electricity through it and see what it does. And then they would do that, you know. And so it didn't matter what they were doing, they would put electricity through whatever they were doing. And so they wanted to see, okay, let's see how electricity behaves in a glass tube in a vacuum. And they got really excited about that. So, Crookes was the one who was making one of these tubes, Sir William Crookes. Um, and he basically, um, he noticed that there were some rays that were, were going when he was passing electricity through here, even though it was pretty much in a vacuum, um, that there were these green rays that were passing from one side to the other. He was like, well, what is this exactly? What is this stream of... Uh, something that's passing through here, okay? And uh, the rays became known as cathode rays. Now, nobody knew what they were, okay? Nobody could figure out why do we have this sort of green beam of, of rays that are traveling through here, okay? But they knew two things about the rays. They knew they were charged particles, and they knew that they were negatively charged. Well, how did they know that? Well, not necessarily. It's a good thought, but, but, but it didn't have anything to do with the green, necessarily, the green color. Um, what might they have been able to do to figure out that this stream of particles going through this glass tube actually had a charge? Okay, so you're on the right track there. Now, maybe a simpler way to do that is let's put a magnet up to the glass tube, okay, and, and see what happens, right? Um, and so that's that's what they did. So let me show you this video. Hopefully this is going to work here. Okay, so when they put a magnet up to the cathode ray tube, 
depending on which direction the magnet was pointed, um, it actually deflected the ray. Okay, and they said, oh, okay, so this thing is it's repelled by the negative end of the magnet. Okay, and it's attracted to the positive end. So I always get worried when suggested YouTube videos come up because you never know what's going to pop up there. Um, okay, so the idea here is they knew that it had a charge and because it was attracted to the positive end of the magnet they knew that it was a negative charge. Okay, uh, Thompson was trying to figure out the mass of these charged particles. Okay, um, and he couldn't figure that out but he was able to figure out the charge to mass ratio. Okay. In other words, if you take the charge divided by the mass, he knew he knew that ratio. Okay, um, and then he compared that ratio to other known ratios. So, the charge to mass ratio was known for hydrogen. Okay, um, and it was known that okay for every one charge that hydrogen had, here was the mass that the hydrogen had. Okay, um, what he realized was this charge to mass ratio, the mass was a lot smaller. Um, in other words, the, the charge to mass ratio is actually a lot bigger for these based on the charge and the mass of these things. And so what, what he realized was we're dealing with particles and it doesn't matter that you exactly understand how he came to this conclusion. The conclusion he came to was these particles in this cathode ray tube, they're actually smaller than the smallest atom that we know of, which is hydrogen. Okay. And once he realized they were smaller than the smallest atom we know of, he jumped to the conclusion that there must be things that are smaller than atoms. In other words, there must be pieces that make up the atoms. Okay? And so he said Dalton was wrong. Okay? The atom can be divided into smaller parts, and these smaller parts here, that's what's going through this cathode ray tube right now. Okay? These green, this green beam of charged particles that's going through here, this is actually something, and he called it electrons, okay? Um, now, Thompson was never able to figure out what the mass of an electron was, the actual size of it. Um, Millikan was another scientist, and he was actually able to figure out the charge on the electron, okay? And since he knew the charge on the electron, he was able to figure out the mass, because Thompson had already worked out the charge to mass ratio. And so Thompson said, okay, if anyone can come along and can either find the mass of the electron or the charge of the electron, then we can figure out the other one because he already knew the ratio, okay? Um, and so Millikan was able to do an experiment where he figured out the charge on one electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. C stands for coulombs. If any of you guys are in physics right now, you're probably going to talk about that at some point this year. Um, it's just a measure of electrical charge. Okay, and then Millikan, once he knew the charge, then he used Thompson's charge to mass ratio, and he said, okay, the mass of one electron is 9 times 10 to the negative 28 grams, which is very, 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 very small, okay? Um, which is 1 1840th the mass of a hydrogen atom, okay? So it turns out Thompson was right. There is something that's smaller than the atom and it's the electron, okay? And then the charge of the electron, instead of using this number all the time, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th, that's kind of an awkward number. So we just use the number negative 1, or 1 minus, okay? Everybody okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'd rather not write that number all the time. So we call this a 1 minus charge, okay? All right, so let me show you what Millikan did on his oil drop experiment, and I'm going to narrate this as best as I can here. This is working well so far. Okay, so he had this apparatus like this, and basically what he did is he took and he sprayed um, oil, little oil droplets, into this chamber that was essentially a vacuum until he sprayed the oil into it. It fell through a filter, and what that, what that filter did, it was sort of a charged filter, and so it separated the oil into individual droplets, okay? As the droplets were falling, um, he was passing x-rays through the drops with these little tubes right here. Those are shooting x-rays, okay? And what happened there is that he was making these oil drops have a charge, okay? And then he turned the voltage on, okay? So he had, you know, a, a negative charge at the bottom, I think a positive charge at the top, okay? 
and what happened was some of these oil drops actually stopped in midair. Okay? Some of them fell more slowly. Some of them actually started to rise back up based on the charge. So he could adjust the charge and he could see the behavior of the oil drops. Okay? And so what he worked out there was that each of these oil drops, he, he could figure out the mass on each of the oil drops. I don't remember exactly how he did that part. But he was able to figure out the mass on each of the oil drops. And when he figured that out, then he could sort of work out that, okay, this, this mass to charge thing. He could figure out that each of those... Um, each of those oil drops had a certain charge to it, okay? And when he broke that down to its smallest whole number ratio, he was able to come up with that charge on the electron number that we talked about before, okay? Might not make a ton of sense to you as far as how he did it. The main thing that I really care about is that you know that he was able to figure out the charge on the electron, and he used this oil drop apparatus to do it, okay? That's the main thing there. So. After the electron was discovered, Thompson said, well, we need a new model of the atom, okay? The marble doesn't do it anymore because there's something else inside that atom besides just um, the atom. It's made up of parts, okay? And Thompson, um, well, he was English, and I guess he liked plum pudding. I don't know. So he came up with the plum pudding model of the atom, okay? His idea was you've got this pudding, or this sort of gelatin soupy type thing, and, and that's what most of the atom is made of, and, and it's positively charged. And then you've got these little negative plums that are stuck in there, okay? We might uh, be from, more familiar with the chocolate chip cookie model, okay? It's basically the same thing, right? You've got the cookie, and the cookie is positively charged, and the little chocolate chips that are in there are the negative charges, okay? That was his model of the atom. Now, how, how correct is that? Is that what we think today? No. This model lasted a few years. I mean, a couple of years. It was not very long at all before someone came along and said, eh, you know, plum pudding's okay, but that's not a good model for the atom. So, actually, I've never had plum pudding. Have any of you ever had plum pudding before? Yeah, it doesn't sound that good. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's an English thing, I guess. What's that? Well, okay, it's not soupy. It's, you know, it's, it's like pudding. Pudding. Soupy is a bad word because that's, that's too runny, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't want runny. This is making me sick to my stomach a little bit. I don't know. Okay, anyway. I'm going to come back to this video in a second because um, I want to talk a little bit about what, what Rutherford did, and then I'll show you the actual video of, of how he did it. Okay? Rutherford, this guy was cool. Um... Scientist from New Zealand, he did all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and, and again, I wish I could find this video. I'm just going to have to tell it to you. And I'm not going to do as good a job as the guy because the guy's from New Zealand and he has this really cool accent. And, uh, and if I try to talk like that, I'm going to sound like the crocodile hunter or something and then it's going to be ridiculous. So, um, anyway. Radioactivity was like a brand new thing at the turn of the, uh, the century, in the 1900s, early 1900s. And, uh, you know, scientists were just fascinated with these, these materials they were finding that actually, if you hold them in your hand long enough, they burn your hand, okay? It's just a rock. You hold it in your hand, and it starts to burn you, okay? It's like, what, what is going on here? There's, there's like energy coming out of this rock. And so it was... Well, okay, I mean, someone did that the first time, and they were like, hey, guys, don't do what Fred did. <laughs> he got a huge burn on his hand. <laughs> he got a huge burn on his hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then later his hand fell off. So don't do that, guys. Anyway, I mean, this was, this was dangerous stuff that they were playing with. It was uranium, you know, radioactive rock. And um, so what Rutherford did... He said, hey, let's turn this into a gun, okay? So he got really excited about this. And, and basically, what they realized was the, one of the only things that can actually stop this radiation is lead, okay? Because lead is so dense. And so he built this lead box, and the box had one tiny little hole, 
one tiny little opening in it, and that's the opening that all the radioactive particles shot out of because they couldn't go anywhere else, right? So he made this little radioactive gun that he could shoot in one direction, um, which was pretty cool. And so, you know, he's he's got his radioactive gun. He's like, okay, well, now what do I point this at, okay? Because there's got to be something cool I can do with this gun. Well, Thompson had just come out with his idea that the atom was mostly this soupy, no, not soupy, gelatinous, um, yeah, there you go, um, empty space, okay? Um, or it wasn't very thick, and then you had these little plums floating around in it, okay? So based on Thompson's idea, Rutherford thought that he could shoot his radioactive particles right through sheets of gold foil, okay? Now, the reason he picked gold is because gold atoms are a little bit bigger, okay? And it also can be hammered into very, 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 very thin sheets that are just a few atoms thick, okay? And so he hammered these into very thin sheets. He hung them up, and he had a radioactive gun that he was shooting at these gold, at this gold foil, okay? And then on the other side, he had a detector that would light up every time a radioactive particle hit it. So he could see when the particles were going through the gold foil, okay? And he was just trying to prove Thompson's idea correct by saying the atom is mostly just this, you know, non-dense empty space that things can go right through, okay? And so he was shooting um, through this gold foil, and he found something kind of interesting. Um, some of the alpha particles, and that's just the name for the radiation that he was shooting out of his radiation gun, um, some of them bounced back when they hit the gold foil, which was crazy. And he said basically this, this was like, if you shot a bullet at a piece of tissue paper and the bullet ricocheted and came back at you. That's how unexpected this was that this actually happened. Okay, so let me go back to the video and I'm going to give you a little bit of a visual here of what was going on. And this video is a little long and you're missing some great music right now. So I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Um, let me enlarge this. Wait, what happened? What happened? I thought I was trying to make it a full screen video. Is this playing twice now? Awesome. Go away. <laughs> what? Oh, gosh. Sorry. Hang on just a second. Let me just end this. There we go. Yeah. Okay. What are you doing, sir? There we go. Okay. So this is showing the setup for the experiment, and then I'm going to have to figure out how to get back where I was. Um, and this is a little bit different than Rutherford's setup. This is an alpha particle source. Now, his was much more rudimentary than this. I mean, it really was just a box with a hole. Okay, it was a lead box with a hole. And so you can see there's the piece of gold foil there. Okay, so the radiation is going to come out of here and hit the gold foil. And then there is a detector back here. Now, again, this isn't exactly the way that he had his setup. His was set up with a screen, and I'm going to show you a picture of how his setup worked. Okay. Um, but what they're doing here is they're shooting these radioactive particles at the gold foil, and they've got a detector that's going to show where it hits, okay? I'm, do I'm doing a video. No, you can't. Sorry. You're not allowed. <laughs> yeah, I miss you too. That's going to be super awkward on the video. Yeah. Old student just came in. Not an old student. I was a former student. Um, okay. So... Basically, I just wanted you to be able to see this setup, and now I'm going to show you a picture of if I can figure out how to even get out of this thing now. Yeah, I'm going to probably have to do it over here. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint here. And I went ahead and started it over. That's cool. Okay, so here's where we were. Um, and so what... Uh, what he had happen with his setup, and, and he basically had a bunch of lag, lab people that would do this for him. Um, they just sat there and they watched it for hours. And every time the screen lit up, they made a mark. Okay? Hit the screen here. And then every time, you know, every time it bounced back, they made a mark. Um, one thing Rutherford did that was kind of crazy, because, I mean, he wasn't expecting this to happen. But he built his detector all the way around the gold foil. Okay? And again, I don't know why he did that exactly. He just had really great instincts about this sort of thing. Um, and he just thought, okay, well, let's make sure that none of them are bouncing back over here. So we'll even have the detector over on this side, okay? So he's got his alpha particle source here. It's shooting through this thing, hitting the gold foil. 
And he expected them all to hit, you know, right around here. And most of them did, okay? Most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil and hit there. But then some of them bounced back. And I'm drawing a picture here, and I'm realizing I think that this actually shows this to you. Um, let's see. Yeah, it does. See, there's the laser. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So most of it went through like he expected, but a few of these hit something and bounced back. Now, they're not hitting the plums, okay? Plums are not going to stop um, stop this alpha radiation from going through. They, they must be hitting something more dense and more concentrated and more massive than that, okay? And so that's what led Rutherford to the idea, well, here's what's happening. You've got these atoms of gold foil, few atoms thick, okay? And then when you shoot the alpha particles in, most of them are going straight through, but some of them are hitting something in the center of these atoms, and they're bouncing back, okay? And so that's the idea of what, what's going on here. It led him to the idea of the nucleus, which we're very familiar with now with the atom, right? You guys learned this in, what, sixth grade? Fifth grade? I don't know. Whenever. Whenever what? Or whenever you watch Jimmy Neutron, then you learned about the neutron. Okay, so based on his experiment, and, and again, I, I wish that I could have found that video for you guys because it really does a better job of, of that than I just did. Um, but here are the conclusions that he came to. He said, okay, uh, Rutherford was, or, sorry, uh, Thompson was right about empty space, the atom being mostly empty space. But there is something in the middle of this thing, okay? And it's a dense region. And it's tiny, okay? And it's in the center of the atom. So really, this is more like a, um, I don't know, a cherry. This is maybe the cherry model of the atom, right? Except, you know, the nucleus is smaller than that, but it's, you know, you've got the cherry, and then you've got the seed in the middle, right? Okay, that was his nucleus. So he also said the nucleus has a positive charge. Now, here's how he decided that. The, the particles that he was shooting at the gold foil were positively charged, okay? What happens when a positive charge comes close to another positive charge? They repel, right? Okay, if, if it had been a negative charge in the center, it would have been attracted to the alpha particles, not, they wouldn't have repelled, okay? And so he decided these alpha particles, because they're positive, the nucleus must also be positive, okay? Um, and then he decided the negatively charged electrons move through empty space outside the nucleus, okay? So he had to do something with Thomson's electrons, um, and he decided they must just be outside the nucleus somewhere, because we know that they have a negative charge, okay? So that was his model of the atom. He did a pretty good job of explaining the atom um, for a few years, okay? And that's, that's kind of where we're going to stop for now on the... Um, on the talking about the atoms type thing, okay? So, there were a couple other things that happened here to sort of round out the picture of the atom that we have, okay? Um, one is that, let me see here. Okay, sorry, I lost my place here. So, Rutherford decided this positively charged nucleus um, He's going to call those protons, okay? I'm not sure where he got the name protons from, um, or if he even named it protons necessarily. He's the one that discovered them, okay? Um, but they have a charge of plus one, okay? He decided that it's equal and opposite to that of the electron, but they're probably more massive than the electron, okay? And then a co-worker of his in 1932, so quite a few years later, discovered the neutron, okay? Now... The dates here are interesting, okay? What else was starting to happen around 1932? Great Depression. What was coming very shortly after the Great Depression? World War II. And what happened in World War II? What ended World War II, essentially? Yeah, the atomic bomb, okay? Which had a lot to do with neutrons, all right? So this all, I mean, it was starting to happen pretty quickly here, but in 1932, they found the neutron in the center of the atom. Not only did they find it, they figured out ways to shoot neutrons at other atoms, okay? And once they figured out how to do that, what they were trying to do initially was to make bigger atoms, 
and they ended up actually breaking atoms apart. And when they did that, it released this huge amount of energy, and that's where the atomic bomb came from. Okay, and that's where the nuclear power plants that we have today actually—that's the principle that they work on as well—is shooting neutrons at big atoms and splitting them apart. Okay, um, and so these are the two, you know, the two pieces that needed to be added here. Um, sorry that that looks like that. Is this already filled out for you guys on your chart? Okay. So let me just talk about this quickly. Um, the symbol for these, you need to pay attention to this because you might see it written this way sometimes and then you're going to wonder what is that unless you're familiar with it. The electron is written as E minus, why E minus? It has a negative charge, okay? Proton is written as P plus because it has a positive charge. And then the neutron, yeah, it's neutral, so we give it a zero charge, okay? So that's why, now a lot of times you'll see a neutron just written as N without anything um, because, you know, another way to say it has no charge is just not write anything there. Um, the location, uh, the electron is going to be outside the nucleus, okay? Now, is this all review for you guys where the proton, neutron, and electron are? Okay. Um, did you learn this in biology last year, or was it earlier than that? Okay, okay. So it's been a while. Um, but the electron is outside the nucleus. The proton and the neutron are in the nucleus, okay? And then the, the charge, we just talked about that. The relative mass, if each of these are 1, then this is 1 over 1840, 1840. Now, where did you see that number earlier in the notes? Yeah, this is this electron is 1 1840th the mass of a hydrogen atom. That's weird. Okay, well, it turns out a hydrogen atom, if you look on the periodic table here, has atomic number one. Oh, wait. <laughs> periodic table here. Yeah, we've got a nice one now. Has atomic number one, okay? And what that means is it has one proton, okay? And it actually has no neutrons. So a hydrogen atom basically is just a proton and an electron, okay? And so it makes sense that if an electron is 1 1840th the mass of a proton, it would also be 1 1840th the mass of a hydrogen atom. Because hydrogen atom is basically just a proton. Okay? All right. So that's it for that. I think we actually made it through the video okay. Um, and let me say this again in case I forget to say it in seventh hour. Uh, your homework is on the board. Okay? And this is what I would do, you know, just look over these things, and you might actually take some time right now because we've got about 10 or 15 minutes. I would just pull out that stuff and study, make sure that you are ready for the quiz that we're going to take tomorrow, and then you don't necessarily have to worry about it for homework. There's some books in the back that you guys can use if you want to share, or, again, if you want to brave the Internet, you can uh, try and pull up the netbook on there. Um, not the netbook, the, the online textbook on your netbook, okay? Um, so go ahead and work on that, and then we'll take the quiz first thing tomorrow. This concludes our video. Thank you for watching today. Hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.